Uh, hello, everyone. Um, let me go to the first slide. So I work for Skimlinx, as Nathan said. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Skim, what Skimlinx does as a company, uh, and then very quickly uh, go into why we're using machine intelligence and machine learning. So I'll use that. OK, so Skimlinx, um, we have, we, Skimlinx is all about monetizing content for publishers. Um, and we have the philosophy that um, traditional advertising, when you have banners at the top of the page and you have these kind of sponsored links at the side, it's kind of, um, it, this is peripheral advertising and it doesn't really affect the consumer behavior that much. So we concentrate on text links and we think this is much more powerful. Um, people tend to believe uh, individuals like bloggers when they're talking about products, dresses and handbags and stuff, they are, they, they're much more believable um, when they're actually writing in articles um, with their own personal voice. Um, so we, we want to facilitate um, the whole process of publishers being monetized for this kind of content. So you can see here there's a, someone talking about this camera, this Nikon D90. Um, and we will do, we have a number of products um, which help in the process of making this piece of text monetizable. Um, so for instance, um, we we, we um, allow the, the publisher to, uh, aff what's in a process known as affiliatization, um, so that if someone clicks, this, if this is a link, if someone clicks, the user clicks on this um, and buys something, if they buy that camera from Amazon, let's say, then the publisher will get some money, and we will get some money too. Um, so this is, this is just to say the process, we make this process really easy. You can do this in a very manual um, way, um, which is what people used to do. We just automate the whole process. Um, so this is us. This is where we really install one line of code. Uh, and it makes things um, really, really easy for the uh, publishers. So we're on lots of publishers' um, sites. We're on a one and a half million publishers' sites. Um, um, and we're, we, we are helping the publishers, not just with monetizing their content, but also understanding their content. Um, and that's where the machine learning comes in. Um, so we process uh, around 6 billion pages a month, um, and mainly we're trying to identify mentions of products or brands um, in the text. Um, and we're an ad tech company, so we want, you know, we want to really help publishers in their advertising process. Um, so you're 6, million, 6 billion pages per month, and it's, uh, we, we think around, well, over 500 million users are exposed to our natural language processing systems. Um, and the point is that we need to get this right. If, if, if we get it wrong, then um, it's going to cost us money and it'll cost us clients. And I'll give you an example. This is actually quite um, a minor product that we have. But one thing that we can do is that we can take some text which doesn't have any links in it, um, and we can put links in. So we, can f we, we predict what the product is um, uh, that the writer's talking about, and we insert a link. So in this case, this is, this is about this TV program called Loose Women. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's quite good. Um, they're, they, you know, they're talking about TV stuff, celebrities and stuff. Um, and there's a, there's a piece of text here um, which mentions loose women. And ideally, you would want to turn that link into a link to a DVD box set for loose women or something like that, something related to the program. Uh, what you don't want to do is something like this. Um, advertise loose women trousers purely be because of the keywords kind of match up. But if you think about it, it's quite, you know, this is quite a challenging problem because, you know, the text on this page, it's not obvious that this is really about a TV program. It doesn't mention the word TV. It doesn't mention the word DVD or box set. Um, and you kind of have to know that Colleen Nolan is a presenter on uh, Loose Women to really do this problem, um, to, to, to solve this problem very well. Um, so I want to say that building any NLP systems is really annoying and really expensive um, at the moment, or historically has been. Um, and partly this is because um, there's a dependence on handcrafted features. So for solving this kind of problem. Um, you really need to spend a lot of time extracting features from the data, um, playing around with things. There's a lot of trial and error, you know, trying to figure out what, what's actually working, what's not working, thinking about the problem. You really need some domain knowledge. Um, you need specialist people, really, who are extremely expensive and quite difficult to find. Um, and partly, this can be mitigated by having lots of labeled examples. Um, but again, that's very expensive. You need human beings to label the examples for you. Um, and the really horrible thing is that if you want to make a new product or you want to work in a new domain, um, let's say you've got a product that works very well on technology products, um, your NLP system works on technology products, but now you want to build something that works on fashion products, you have to start all over again. Um, it's really painful. Um, so I want to talk about uh, a couple of things that I think are going to make 
developing this kind of system much easier. Um, I'll talk a little bit about deep, well, I'll talk mainly about deep learning, and if there's time at the end, I'll talk about Spark, but there, there may not be. Um, so deep learning, so, uh, you know, deep learning really became, started to become really, really um, uh, famous, I guess, in 2012, when um, Jeff Hinton's lab at, at the University of Toronto won the ImageNet um, image uh, classification problem in 2012. So um, this problem was um, to classify a million images into a thousand different classes. Um, this team almost halved the previous error rate, or the second um, highest uh, error rate. Um, it, was, it was a major um, step forward, and in every subsequent year, there's two years since then, um, this, this kind of technology, deep learning, has almost halved again the, the error rate. Um, and deep learning is really, simply put, just, a, just neural networks with a, a deep architecture, and by that I mean many layers, uh, many hidden layers. Neu neural networks traditionally um, have been limited to a, a small number of hidden layers, and deep learning is just, let's have lots of deep layers. It could be 10 or 20 layers rather than one or two. Um, I, actually, I'm gonna talk about this one first. And this is to say that um, this deep learning is really inspired by uh, biological cognition. Um, so this is a picture of the human brain. Um, you can see the optic nerve coming in from the eye, um, and then this goes into this thing, it's called the LGN, and then this optic radiation goes into um, this part of the uh, uh, um, uh, cerebral cortex called the V1. Um, and this is really, does very simple image processing. Um, <laughs> it does edge detection, basically. So the neurons in the V1 will um, respond to, to different edges in different orientations, really. It doesn't do much more than that. But then no, um, neurons go from V1 to, to V2, and um, V2 then does some more complicated processing, like figures out what's the foreground, what's the background. And then the, uh, V4 does things like recognizes triangles and squares and uh, actual um, geometric shapes. And then all of these feed into the inferior, inferior temporal cortex which recognizes things like shapes, uh, like actual objects and faces and things like that. And so you can get some r weird kind of conditions where um, if someone has a lesion in the inferior temporal cortex, they, they can't recognize a, uh, a hammer, for instance, but they can, you know, they can draw the hammer and they can, they can see it and they can, they, they, they can say what the shape of it is, what the color is, um, but they can't actually recognize it as a hammer. So that's like very sophisticated processing that's happening there. So we have this kind of layered hierarchical system in our own brains. Um, and the promise of deep learning um, is that, um, well, one of the promises is, is that by using this kind of hierarchical structure, we can make better use of data. Um, so this is from um, Joshua Bengio's lab um, from Montreal. Um, they won the um, unsupervised and transfer learning challenge in 2011 using a deep learning approach. Um, and this, is, this figure is to show by adding layers, they achieve much better efficiency in terms of the data, much better learning efficiency. So the y-axis here is, is accuracy, and the x-axis is the amount of data. So with, with, with just the raw data, um, you're not very efficient. It takes you a long time to achieve any accuracy. Adding another layer makes it much, you start to achieve accuracy sooner. But once you've added four layers, you really don't need very much data at all to achieve optimal accuracy on the problem. And that's, that's really the point of deep learning. Um, so back to NLP, so, so you know, one of the problems with, um, what, one of the reasons why it takes so much data to train an NLP, NLP system at the moment um, is because people use what's known as a bag of words representation for sentences. Um, so that's, that has two problems really, and the first problem is that in a bag of words representation, um, words are considered as atomic units. There's no relationship between the words. So this is to say, that this example says, I want to kill the writer of this book. Uh, and in a traditional bag of words representation, the writer here has no relationship whatsoever to, to author. So if your training data has this first sentence in it, and your test data has the second um, sentence in it, you won't know that the sec what the second sentence means, um, unless you've explicitly seen the word author in this context um, before. Um, and there's another problem, which is that because the words are considered as just a jumble of words added together with no, no structure in the sentence, um, you have things like this sentence will have the same score in most bag of words um, systems as the first two examples. Um, 
the actual meaning of the second sentence is completely different. It's the, it has the opposite polarity to the, to the first, um, the opposite sentiment to the first um, two examples. But um, a bag of word system just won't recognize that. Um, and this is, as I said, one of the reasons why, why um, it's, it's so painful and why you need so much training data. Um, so um, just, I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but this is um, one of the first neural representations um, of language. And this was supposed to really beat this problem where you have words as atomic units and start, instead start representing um, words uh, in a vector representation, just a list of numbers, which means that now you can start to show relationships between words. Because it, you know, if you think about it, just thinking of words, there's this kind of intuition where if you think auth if you don't know that the word author is similar to the word writer, you don't really understand language. And the intuition is that the machine is just not understanding language. It's just doing some tricks with numbers. It's not really. It doesn't have a deeper understanding. Um, and there is a sense in which if you if you can in, encode this this relationship between words, the machine has gone one step further towards actually understanding language. Um, so this is, um, I'm just going to say that um, these, these are vector representations of words. Um, and this is, uh, a, you know, an otherwise fairly classic um, multi-layer perceptron. Um, I won't go into any details, but the idea here is that what you're trying to do is, is predict the next word in a sentence from the previous words. Um, so these are the vectors for the previous words, um, and the whole thing is cast as a prediction problem. So all you need to do is make some vectors which can predict the next word really well, and then the, and then, um, the next, you know. The assumption is that these are then good representations of words. Um, and this is, um, so I should say the previous work was by um, Joshua Bengio's group. Um, this is um, by... Colbert and colleagues, and this came out in 2011. Um, this is a really great paper called Natural Language, in, Natural La Natural Language Processing Almost from Scratch. Um, and they took a very similar approach. Um, I don't think I've got time to go into loads of detail, but um, what they then went on to do critically was use the representations um, of the words, the vector representations, in natural language processing um, problems of the type that I mentioned earlier. So, you know, we need to find products in text. That's, that's a, um, like, we need to find product entities in text. They used this kind of system to, to do that kind of problem. And they found really good results. Um, and, the, you know, it was fairly um, important because the b benchmark systems that they were testing against had handcrafted features, which may have taken years to develop. And they just used a system like this, which didn't have any handcrafting of features. Um, it just had data um, uh, to achieve very similar performance. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, no, maybe I sh should. How have I got? Um, no, I'm not going to talk about that. But I am going to talk about this. So, so um, this is from. Uh, Thomas Mikolov in 2013, um, and other colleagues at Google. Um, word to vec. So you probably heard of Word to vec. Um, it was fairly big news at the time. Um, just to say that this is now really, this, this um, representation, which is a skip ground model, really turns the previous algorithm on its head, and now uses a single word to predict the surrounding context. So this is the single word, it's WT. And these are the words surrounding that word in a sentence. And you use the single word to predict the uh, outer words. Um, so you, this is to represent this. This is this equation is just showing you that what I just said. Um, and you're trying to optimize this um, and maximize the likelihood of these words um, given a single word. Um, and oh, so this this um, uh, this graphic hasn't come out properly. But 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 the intuition here is that this. Um, in a product here is represents the similarity between this word and these words. And this represents the similarity between all random words in the, um, uh, in the, in the vocabulary. So what you want to do is make the words as similar to the, the um, words in the same context as similar to each other as possible. And you want to make other words, other combinations of words, as dissimilar as possible. And if you can find some representation that does that, 
um, you have good representations of the words. That's the idea here. So, so re really, it's quite simple. The model is very simple, and most of the paper is really about computational tricks to make this whole process a bit easier. So, for instance, this is not explicitly calculated, but there's some kind of clever sampling method. Thank you. Um, so, um, so if you take the word representations that words of that gives you, um, and you, you can you can because they're vectors, you can say which, which vectors are similar to other vectors. Um, and let's find the words which are similar to the word knee. And you'll see that it's ankle, groin, elbow, calf muscle, kind of anatomical stuff. So that seems to make sense. And then uh, something more similar to what we're doing, uh, like a product, like socks, um, gives you some vectors which are very, um, seem to be close in meaning to the, to the word socks, which is quite nice. Um, but there are some other really nice characteristics of the word to vector vectors, and that's that relationships between words represent some meaning. Um, in this case, um, you can see here you've got the relationship to Poland, to Warsaw, Warsaw being the capital of Poland, um, is the same or very similar to the relationship between Germany and Berlin and France to Paris. So there, there are some really nice properties of these, of these vectors. Um, I know this is a horrible slide. Um, but what's really important here is that I've actually taken um, the results from two different papers um, to show, just look at these two columns. Um, these are sentiment analysis problems. Um, so, you know, um, is this sentence a positive sentiment, a happy sentiment, or is it a, a, a negative sentiment? Uh, and these are, these are the traditional methods. Uh, I'm not going to go into details. Uh, and these, are, these numbers are accuracies. And you can see the neural methods, which are these four at the top, have higher accuracy than, than these. That's, that is all this is trying to say. Um, so this is now the state of the art for sentiment analysis, um, which is, um, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not going to go into any details of this specific model here, but the, you, can, you can check out the paper. Um, but it's really starting to look like these models are coming out of just academic interest and really important to um, building real systems in the wild. Um, but there is a, something of a problem with these vectors um, in that, um, you know, this is, uh, I've tried to find words which are similar to the word good, and it seems some of these words are quite useful, like great, terrific, and decent, um, but obviously this is not ideal. If you're trying to do a sentiment analysis, the fact that um, this vector for bad is very similar to the vector for good is not going to help you very much, and it's going to confuse everything. Um, and that's because bad really has the same kind of function as good in language. It's found with a very similar, um, com in a very similar context. So there have been various methods to attack this problem. Uh, I'm running out of time, but um, th I, this is, I've put this down as some words of caution, really, because this, this kind of, this is a, um, quite a complex model that was um, published in 2011. It um, uh, was very promising at the time. Um, I actually made a... Uh, sentiment analysis product in 2012 using this technology and, and compared it with a baseline which of a, a very simple baseline, just a naive base classifier, and found that it had about the same um, performance. Um, and, th and then this, was, this paper was published also saying something very similar, really. Um, this is the, um, the neural encoding that I just showed you, and then these are traditional things like naive bays and support vector machines. Um, again, don't, you know, the take, don't, don't bother looking at the numbers, but the take-home message here is that really this, the neural method didn't perform um, as, you know, performed about as well as the naive Bayes and the traditional methods. So there's some caution around, there's a lot of uh, positive, like there was a lot of excitement about these methods at the moment, but um, try them out for real, and, um, and there is some way to go in actually using these vector representations. Um, but um, this paper, uh, was published last year, and <coughs> what they did was just take the, the neural embeddings, the word vectors, and try to uh, compare them to actual human, uh, human labelings of uh, similarity between words. So they'll literally take the word sock, and they'll take the word knee, and they'll, go to, and they'll ask a human being, are these, how similar are these words? And then they'll say sock and castle, how similar are these words? Um, and they really, they did a very, very thorough study um, and the vector representations wipe the floor with, the, with traditional representations. Um, and what was really interesting is here, this second quote here, where they say the state-of-the-art results were obtained in almost all cases. So that state-of-the-art was the 
the traditional methods. The state-of-the-art results were obtained in almost all cases using specialized approaches that rely on external knowledge, manually crafted rules, parsing, larger corpora, or task-specific tuning. Our predict results were instead achieved by simply downloading the words of X toolkit and running. Um, so we think this is really exciting, and we are um, basically um, recoding a a all of our systems to use this kind of technology because we, think, we really think that it's going to be a big step forward. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Spark um, at all. We don't really have time. Um, but that, and that's it, really. That, the, 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 the summary for us is that um, this is going to be a really big change in the way that new um, natural language processing systems are built. Um, it's going to make it much easier and much cheaper to build this kind of system. Um, and um, it really means that it's accessible to a company like us. Who, we don't really have Google resources, um, but we still are able to have access to these kind of immensely sophisticated models. And that's it. Thank you.